Hey everybody, I am Ryan Doyle, this is The Verdigree Table, and in this series, I am going to walk you through Menace Under Otari, which is the adventure inside the Pathfinder 2nd Edition Beginner Box. I've run it a couple different times for a couple different groups, and I would do it again because I really enjoy this little dungeon, and I think it's just like an expertly designed introduction to Pathfinder and to tabletop role-playing games in general. In the 20 or so encounters, which will take you two, maybe three sessions, to get through. Menace Under Otari not only gives a hands-on demonstration of all the basic mechanics, it also packs a ton of interest and variety in a very small package with the right balance of like giving us the standards while peppering in some weirdness. So even experienced players who are very familiar with TTRPGs or even Pathfinder 2nd Edition are still going to find a lot of fun in here. In this one, we're going to do some preliminary overview before you start work. And part of that will be to focus on incorporating a few things that aren't in this box, including things that will set you up for success in the future beyond this adventure so that you can seamlessly continue the story and hook your players so they can't wait for the next game night. Game masters with a lot of experience, even with this specific system, could find that info very helpful, so make sure you stick around to the end for that. In the follow-up videos in this series, we are going to go over each encounter in here, room by room, floor by floor, so you feel prepared and confident that you are going to provide a ton of fun and an epic experience for your players and have an awesome time doing it. So make sure to subscribe to the Verdigree Table so you don't miss that. Now, these videos here are intended for game masters, the person running the game. If you are a player who is going to take a character through the Pathfinder 2nd Edition Beginner Box, you should not watch this. We are not talking about the kind of game where having a guided walkthrough before you play is going to improve your experience, and it may actually suck some of the fun out of things for you. Plus, it's even more likely to make things less fun for the people you will be playing with, particularly the game master who's spending a lot of time and energy to create an awesome experience for everyone. Obviously, I can't stop players from watching this, but listen. Here on YouTube, more people spending more minutes watching your videos is the name of the game. That's why we're always like, please hit like, hit subscribe, all that stuff. Leave comments, help us feed the beast of the algorithm. So I am actually arguing against my own self-interest here to try to make sure you and the folks you share this experience with have the best time possible. So if you were about to play a character in Menace of Otari, please do us both a favor and only watch this video after you've played through the whole dungeon. Okay, so just game masters or potential game masters? Great. Listen, first thing I'm going to tell you is that after watching this series, you are going to be ready to run this game. You might not necessarily feel ready. You might have a voice in your head telling you just a few more videos, just a few more guides, just a few more weeks of preparation, but I am telling you, you've already got this. The first time I ever played a game like this, I was the Dungeon Master, running Lost Minds of Fandelver in the Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition Beginner's Box. I hadn't been playing since the 70s or 80s, I had zero experience, and I took a seat here at this very table behind the Dungeon Master screen and led my friends through months of fun and adventures, and we made a ton of great memories that we still talk about years later. I made a whole series on that if you're interested, but look, the point is, and it pains me a little to say this, I'm not special. You can do it too. It's actually going to be easier for you, first off, because you've got me, but also Menace Under Otari is way easier on the Game Master than Lost Mine of Phantolver, and in a lot of ways, Pathfinder 2nd Edition is way easier on GMs than D&D 5e. You don't need to know every rule and have an answer for every possible scenario ready to go before you start. You are going to learn as you go. That's what this whole thing is designed for, and they did a pretty damn good job with that. If something comes up while you're playing and you don't know the specific rule, maybe it's a player character's ability or like a condition or something, it is okay to look it up. You can also use your best judgment in the moment make a ruling, keep things moving, and explain that, like, this is how we're going to do it this time for now, and between sessions, you're going to look up the appropriate rule and figure out, like, the official 
answer. And a very nice feature of Pathfinder is that there's pretty much always an official answer. That means you really don't have to make up much as you go, at least rules wise, especially because it is usually very easy to find these answers. This is the Archives of Nethys, an incredible free resource where everything you need to run Pathfinder rules wise can be found. Make sure you click over to second edition and pay attention to the tags under each listing because if I'm talking about shield the spell and you're looking at shield the item, we might have a little bit of confusion. I'm going to put a link to the archives of Nethys and all of the other resources I'm going to mention in the series down in that description below. And while you're down there, consider joining us on Patreon to help me keep making videos like this and to get your hands on some other cool stuff in the process, like the first look at our upcoming Kickstarter project, the Game Master's Compendium of Explosive Creation. I am super excited to finish creating this thing and release it into the world. I think it's going to make a lot of games better, whatever system you're playing. Stay tuned for more on that. Now, just to be clear, everything you really need to start is in that box, but sometimes it's easier to use a search bar than like leaf through a book in the heat of the moment. Speaking of books, there are two in the beginner's box, the Hero's Handbook and the Game Master's Guide. And together, there's over like 150 pages of material that will generate a ton of game sessions. But out of the gate, you really only have to focus on the adventure itself, which is the first 27 pages of the Game Master's Guide. I would also get familiar with the skills, the playing the game section of the Hero's Handbook. You don't need to memorize like every use of every skill, but at least that last 20, really 10 pages of the Hero's Handbook has the core rules and mechanics you're going to need to know to run the game smoothly. The majority of the book is about building player characters. And speaking of players, ideally you're gonna want three to five of them plus the game master, and you can make six work, but it will slow things down a bit. And if you're looking at seven or eight players, you might actually be better off making two different groups. If you are an experienced game master with experienced players and those players don't mind losing characters now and again, you can even run this for two players with some minor adjustments. I did it, it was awesome. We just did a whole video about why I love running for smaller groups. But if this is your first time out, understand that the math is balanced for four player characters. So try to have about that many. I've got a couple videos on how to find players and build a group, links down below. But with a little bit of luck, you've already got some friends or family lined up. Now, as far as building characters go, I always recommend using pre-mades the first time you are playing any game. The ones in the box are solid and provide different archetypes to choose from. If you want to provide even more options, I'm including a link in the description to even more pre-generated characters that are available for free on the official Paizo website. Character creation in Pathfinder is a little complicated, maybe more than a little, and it can take a while. And now don't get me wrong, it can be a ton of fun. People will spend hours and hours making different characters and classes and tinkering with feats and options, but before you have a great understanding of like how the game works, all those decisions can feel a little bit overwhelming. So I believe it is better to just hit the ground running and play the game a couple of times and only then dive into character creation. That being said, if a player wants to make their own character, awesome, cool, let them. Just make sure that they know that they're signing up for extra work and it's a good idea to establish that you are not going to do all of that work for them. The Game Master already has enough to do. Now, if you have experienced players, an established group, okay, maybe different story. I still tell experienced players they're better grabbing a pre-gen for a new system, but it can be super fun to sit down together and build characters collectively. This way, the party has all like the basic roles covered, no one's stepping on anybody's toes, plus it gives you the chance to weave all of the characters' backstories together, explain how they know each other, and why they're willing to risk their lives for one another. That's where that compendium is going to come in. This is often a part of what we call session zero, and though it doesn't have to take up a whole session if you're building characters, it very well may, which is another reason I say if you're trying to introduce new people to the hobby, maybe don't start with like hours of bookkeeping and decision making that they don't really understand the implications of yet. Yeah, better to just start by playing the game. The other thing that happens in a session zero, which you can cover in a couple minutes before you start playing that first time, is to create an open space for conversation about any boundaries or like off-limit topics that anybody might have. Nearly anything is possible in a tabletop role-playing game. 
which is what makes them awesome, but it also means like something might come up that somebody at the table is uncomfortable with or that might even ruin their good times and like keep them from coming back. And don't assume you know what anyone's been through or that it has to be some big traumatic thing to even be worth talking about. Maybe somebody's dealing with chronic illness or something and like themes of disease or like body horror stuff is just going to make game night less fun for them. Or maybe it will be cathartic for them. Again, don't assume here. I'll often say I don't want to like role play out elaborate romances. If there's a sex scene, we're just going to fade to black instead of like getting explicit with it, especially when I'm sitting down with a group of strangers at the game shop and nobody's exactly my type. <laughs> One, because that's not the kind of game I'm looking for, honestly, but two, because it kind of breaks the ice and opens things up. I'm not trying to yuck anybody's yum here. If you were looking for that kind of game, Go for it, have fun with it, but you just better make sure everybody's on that same page before you dive into that stuff. Personally, I'm a lot less concerned about myself and I'm more focused on creating a space where the players can speak up now or in the future if something's feeling off to them. If you really can't deal with spiders, I can change out the giant spider in here. It's not a big deal. I've also started to see all this as sort of a, a litmus test because if anybody really freaks out over the idea of being kind and considerate to the other people at the table, we all learn maybe they're not going to be the best fit for this group. <laughs> we, we could do a whole video on session zero and safety tools, but suffice it to say it's worth spending just a couple of minutes to establish some guidelines and set the tone. And if you don't believe me, go Google some RPG horror stories. All right. You've got players, they've got characters, and you've established a basic understanding of the rules, both of the game itself and the social contract that keeps things fun. Now let's dive into this adventure. The story kicks off with our player characters, the PCs, agreeing to help Tamily Tandervale. Now you can just describe that to the players, read out the boxed text. It's not actually boxed text in here, but I mean that green writing on page three, and start them off, boop, in the basement. But I would definitely at least consider giving them the chance to actually talk things out with Tamily before they go down there. This can help the players settle into their roles and start thinking like their characters, kind of get in the spirit of a role-playing game. They can ask her questions, get a little more information about what the objectives are here, plus she can ask them questions and get them to share a little bit about their background, their attitudes, maybe even their abilities. A good non-player character NPC is not only a useful plot device, they can also unlock that social side of the game, which the players might not get too much of down in the dungeon. Now, beginners should hear there's even some veterans might need a refresher here. There are at least two perfectly acceptable ways to RP, to role play. This applies to the players and to you, the game master, running NPCs and monsters. You can, you know, do the voice, embody the character, speak in the first person, give them a quirk, a bad accent, a particular mannerism, go nuts, have a ton of fun with it. But, you know, some people, especially those coming into these sorts of games from actual play shows produced by professional actors can sort of assume this is the only way or the right way to do things. But what makes TTRPGs so great is that there's pretty much never one true way to do things. When you RP, you can also narrate what the character says and does, describing their words and actions. That is a perfectly valid way to do things as well. Plus, you don't just have to like choose one style and stick with it. I will often switch between the two, the first person and the third person perspective. The important part of role playing is understanding what the character would do in the situation and letting that drive decision making, not some misplaced desire to win the game. Okay, so however you roleplay her, you should know who Tamily Tandervale is. Tamily Tandervale turned her back on what could have been a lucrative position as a captain among the Grey Corsairs to retire to a safer job here in Otari. The loss of a leg during a raid on a pirate ship having convinced her that serving as a harbor warden would be a wiser decision for her longevity. The jolly and irreverent Tamily maintains a growing collection of peg legs for various occasions that she regularly swaps out. 
Every night from an hour before sundown to an hour before midnight, Tamalee opens the fishery grounds to sailors, laborers, and travelers for games, snacks, and entertainment. A small menu is offered for those who wish to have drinks or snacks while gaming here, the proceeds of which Tamalee frequently gives back in the form of contests and prize money for various impromptu gaming tournaments. Now, some of you out there might be worried because you've read the book cover to cover and you missed some of that information, but don't panic. Part of that was from other resources, which we're getting into because they might be what you want to do after this adventure has finished. Once the player characters, the PCs level up and everyone has fallen in love with Pathfinder and wants to keep playing. So I'm going to help you set up for success and longevity here. Even if you start the adventure down in room one, the PCs are also likely to come upstairs at some point to resupply, get some information, maybe renegotiate, so it is good to be prepared to run Tamley, and it's also wise to at least familiarize yourself with the town of Otari. Now, I think Otari is a great starting town, whether you're a beginner GM or you've got years of experience under your belt, because pretty much everything the players might go searching for is here. All the basics are covered with enough like spice and variation to keep things interesting. You want a tavern to have some drinks and spend the night? Not counting the fishery, there are three, and there used to be four, but one collapsed under mysterious circumstances. Now, if you want to add or change or embellish anything, go for it. This is your world, you can make it your own, but the point is you don't have to. Now, you don't need to memorize every NPC and location. A quick read through those like glass six pages of the GM's guide is going to help you feel ready. Whether you homebrew adventures from here or reach for the more published content that I'm going to be talking about, you might be running this town for months or even years. Now, if your plan is to run a couple sessions and get out, okay, cool, that's fine. Don't worry too much about that. But if you are hoping, even secretly, deep in your heart of hearts, and you haven't even mentioned it out loud because you're afraid of, like, scaring off your players, I see you, I feel you. If, if you're hoping that this little adventure is going to be the start of something epic that gets everyone interested in these characters, enjoying this game, and excited to keep getting together to play, then listen up because I'm going to help you plant two seeds here that might pay off for the next four to 10 levels. The first thing to know is another little nugget about good old Tamalee that doesn't appear in the box. When she first came to town after losing her leg, retiring from the Navy, she ran a fish camp an hour or two outside of town. She came back to Otari you know, proper every winter. And when she saw the opportunity to open the fishery, she had so much success that she actually hasn't been back to that fish camp since. It's been sitting empty for a little over a year. Now, why is that important? Because if and when the players get knocked around and come marching back upstairs to try to bargain for more than that, like 10 gold pieces, each of them was promised, you got something in your back pocket. So if they ask for more and they roll well or they make a persuasive argument, or maybe you just throw it in at the end, you can offer them that fish camp. The deed to an oceanfront five-bedroom house with some outbuildings is a very enticing reward for a day or two's worth of work, isn't it? It's going to give the party a home base and get them invested in this town. And clearing out that camp of all the nasty stuff that move it in since it's been sitting around empty is actually the level two adventure that kicks off Troubles in Otari, a trio of follow-up adventures that pick up where the beginner box leaves off. The other thing I want you to know before you start is to lean into Rin Savixny. She runs Rin's Wonders, the magic shop, which I bet the players are going to be very excited to visit once they find out about it and get some gold in their pockets. Put a bookmark or dog ear or whatever on page 43 before they head there. And beyond being an outlet for their gold and cool stuff, Rin represents the gateway to the other big adventure you could consider running in Notari after the beginner's box, the Abomination Vaults, which is the most popular and generally the best regarded adventure path in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Rin is a potentially great character anyway and can serve a few different functions for you even if you're not planning on running Abomination Vaults next, but it's good to know that a word or two from her could tee up a great adventure that can take the characters through all the way to level 10. So let's take a look at this picture of Otari, which by the way is great to put in front of the players while you're giving them a little overview of the town, either share it on the screen or show them the book, whatever. In this picture, there are four main landmarks. Front and center is the fishery, where this adventure starts. This is 
kind of dwarfed by that log flume showing how the lumber industry is a bigger deal than the fishing industry in this town. Pretty poetic. Over here, kind of off to the side, but drawing the eye with its grandeur and contrast is the Dawnflower Library, where the party will go for any godly business they may have, say to petition for the resurrection of a lost comrade if things go sideways. It is also a library, and as such, a great place to gain knowledge about just about any subject. Now, the fourth one is kind of easy to overlook at first as like background, and that's this lighthouse in the distance reaching into the sky. We kind of expect to see a lighthouse in a port town, right? Except look again because this one seems like it is way too far from the coast to do anybody any good. That's because it is actually the Gaunt Light. Gaunt Light Cape was built by an evil sorceress who was defeated by a band of adventurers nearly 500 years ago. One of those adventurers fell in that battle and the other members of his party founded this town in his honor and named it after him. One night, Rin might see a faint glow illuminating the top of that tower and send the player characters to investigate the Gauntlet, which is actually a mega dungeon that could fill a year or two of game sessions with adventure. I would also put this little like poem thing in my GM's notes to be ready to insert it, maybe when they go exploring in town, have a mother singing it as she rocks a baby to sleep, or have it chanted by groups of kids playing jump rope or hopscotch, or insert medieval fantasy game here, wheel and stick, what, whatever. Have the kids singing this song. Those are the two big items to add to Otari that are not in the box. I've got links to Troubles in Otari and Abomination Vaults in the description, which obviously have way more info, but like those last four or five pages of the Beginner's Box Game Master's Guide should have you covered for your first few sessions. And remember, you don't have to memorize all of this stuff. You can have it in front of you at the table. Now, if you want an even deeper dive into Otari that's presented as if you were on a guided tour in-game, so you can even share it with your players if you wanted to give them like a primer on Otari, get them even more invested. I, I just found this video by the lore tour, and I think that's great. If you check them out, make sure you tell them I sent you. Say hi to the guide for me. Up next in this playlist, I'm going to walk you through room by room the adventure itself. I really hope I see you there. Until then, be kind and have fun.